Hello and welcome to session number four. Hopefully your brains have a little bit more space in them, probably bursting with ideas. My name is Robin and I work out of Higher Fire. I have been a jeweler for over 30 years. That's my main profession. I actually have a degree in everything, in jewelry and metalsmithing. And I've included pottery within the last five, six years and started to mix it up a little bit. Uh, so I'm gonna share with you today my process for making pendants. You can also make earrings, of course. This is a very fiddly thing to work with. So start with pendants. Uh, we're scaling down a lot of stuff that maybe you already know. And then if you get into earrings, we have to scale it down even more and it's sort of the fiddly factor goes up. So we wanna start with something that's manageable and work our way from there. A very, very basic pendant will be, this is my first time with this thing, so hopefully we'll get this right. Your basic piece, jump ring, and a chain, right? So it's a thing with a hole in it. That's, that's your most basic pendant, right? If we look at early, early jewelry, it's a thing with a hole in it that you can put a cord on or a string on. Then you can later on get into what I call pendant plus, get a little bit more fancy. Uh, so I've added some additional elements to this piece and you can even do multiple uh, pieces with clay and combine them for a collage effect. And what's really fun about making your own pendant pieces is you can do the holes however you want to, right? So this one, I've put them in the corners and connected the whole thing together. And what's also fun about this one is this is one texture and then I chopped it up. So that's a really fun way to design. And you're gonna hear me say a lot about design choices because when we scale our pottery down this small, little imperfections have a bigger impact. And so we'll look at different ways that we can do that. Setup, tools. Uh, I like to work on newspaper so that I have a smooth surface. And this also allows me to release the slab easier. Does everyone have experience working with slabs? Yeah, and you know that you have to get your slab up off your surface. And if it's a large slab, you get your fingers under the edge, not too big a deal. Smaller stuff, if you get your finger under the edge, suddenly you've marked it and that's 25% of your piece. So the newspaper allows me to get underneath and then it doesn't matter what's underneath. Your newspaper it can be whatever you want. And this also makes sure like if you're working on a wooden board, you could pick up that wooden texture. You can choose to have that for your back of your piece but be conscious of it, is my point, right? So don't just sort of forget about the backside. Even though I don't glaze the back of my pieces, I still want them to be nice and smooth and appear to have some attention to them, not just, oh yeah, that back part. So I like to work on newspaper. And when I roll out my clay, I work in small slabs. I never use the slab roller uh, because this is, it's gonna dry out quickly, small. I work with porcelain, primarily, and you can, really use any clay you want. I choose porcelain because I like the white, because I like the colors to pop, and because porcelain will accept a lot of fine detail. Can you fire what kind of porcelain do you use? Uh, I go up to 10. So I'm, uh, Higher Fire is a uh, Higher Fire Studio, Cone 10. So everything I do is Cone 10 there. Uh, this translates primarily, you can translate all this to lower fire stuff. I don't have experience with the lower fire. I also like the glazes in reduction in higher fire because of the, the depth. There's kind of these jewel-like tones that come out in those glazes, which is why it, it works well for what I'm doing. And also it's just, that's what we have where I am, so I use it. <laughs> I don't have my own kiln setup. That's, that's my setup over there. All right, let me grab some clay out of here. And what's fun is I could probably make I don't know, 10 things out of this? Uh -huh. <laughs> Your clay is gonna go a long, long way. Is it porcelain? This is porcelain, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, I work with Miller most often, I've done Coleman. Honestly, I can't tell the difference when I'm doing pottery, when I'm doing um, jewelry pieces. You know, if you're throwing, you're gonna get different nuances in the movement and the action, and when you're doing jewelry, it's much smaller scale and you're not gonna notice these differences. But I, I like Miller, it feels good, it works well and I work in small batches. So I'm gonna just start with a little piece here and get my roller going. I use a little pony roller and then I use skewers to uh, give me correct depth and even consistency, right? This is my slab roller set up here. You can get, yeah. Your pocket roller. Yeah, that, that's it. You can also get, if you're into tools and tool collecting, you can get rollers that have 
discs on the end that will mark that for you. You can find it in the uh, cake decorating section at Michael's. Yeah. If you are into uh, precious metal clay, which is a whole other thing, precious metal clay, you can also get a lot of tools for that there as well. Uh, and speaking of tool shopping, if you look in the polymer clay section also at Michael's or wherever you're shopping for stuff or even online, a lot of polymer clay tools, they're scaled for jewelry type yeah. stuff, smaller things, and that works fine for clay. So I'm going to start by getting this going. So you just do a rough roll to get it started. Doesn't You don't need to worry about the skewers just yet. Then when you get closer, I use one hand to hold the skewers. And this will trick you into thinking that it's done. But a lot of times, if you pick it up and move it, and you roll it again, look, it's moved a little bit. So you want to make sure that you do that. Pick it up and move it a couple times until it does not move. And then you know for sure you have a consistent thickness through the whole piece. It will try to fool you. I've done it before. Like, ah, that's good enough. And then you cut through. So that is about, how thick is that? Quarter inch? Skewer thick. Is that, that's, oh, it's, yeah, it's less than a quarter inch. It's less than a quarter inch, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of using, use, yeah, using what I have. So these are, and these are slightly thicker skewers. I was using slightly thinner skewers before. Popsicle sticks are good for earrings, not for pendants. Mm -hmm. They're great for really lightweight earrings, but like I said, uh, learn to do this on something pendant size first before you get to the fiddly business of earrings. So this is the same thickness, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the same thickness there and it is shrunk down. Oh, okay. Yeah, shrinkage, right? Yeah. Like flavor flavor, you know? <laughs> and it will depend on, on the size that you do as well. Uh, more tools to talk about. These I use a lot. And these I got on the poly clay section at Michael's. Round cutters, oval cutters, very handy to have. You can also get different hole cutters. These, Clay Planet sells these. They have, um, I think it's a set of five of these. They also have triangles and squares. Those can be handy as well. And they have a little plunger to help you release. Uh, a note about the plunger though, it will make a little mark mm -hmm. on your piece. So factor that in. And then the ones that I use the most are these hole cutters, which I made. They're brass tubes in three different sizes. And there's a square end for pushing down onto a board. And then there's a tapered end if you run into a situation where you need to cut a hole and you're holding it up here. It's not something you can push down and you need to be up here. The taper allows you to have less resistance going through so you just push and turn like you would a larger hole cutter. Uh, so these are available. I have sets of three for five bucks. I think I have three sets left. If uh, people go wild for these, you can do orders as well. Um, so these are very handy to get different sizes. And I really only use the small one for earrings. It's going to be too small for almost any pendant because remember shrinkage. This looks, it might look okay now, but when it shrinks, it's going to be a lot smaller. So I've rolled out my tiny slab. And now let's do a really, so I'm going to talk about kind of three different ways to texture. And I like to do these kind of flat pendants with texture because I like that graphic quality that you can get. And I don't glaze the back, so they're just sitting face up. So there's a certain ease to them. The clay part of pendant making in this fashion is super easy. It doesn't take very long. You can bang out 20 pendants. It's the glazing that's going to trip you up. Glazing is the hard part. And glazing is the area where we want to make sure we're not rushing, <laughs> taking our time. So I'm just going to grab this fun little texture, kind of uh, tentacly see. I don't know what it is, but I like it. And yeah, I work out of higher fire, so I'm borrowing tools. <laughs> and we're just going to roll that in there. Like little ads running past the screen, higher fire. <laughs> All right, and I like, I'm always looking at the texture and letting that influence the design. So for this texture, I want an oval. Grab one of my oval cutters. Uh, if you are particular about things sticking, you can add some lubricant to your cutters. It doesn't bother me too much. And then choose how you want that to go on there, right? Don't just sort of smash it down. You can look like a little portal and decide what you want to see in your pendant. And I, just go, yeah. Because uh, we want to 
be able to get the holes cut and get the pieces cut. If it's too stiff and you start to cut the hole, then you risk breaking this area up here. Uh -huh. So that's, that's a good question. Um, so you want it to be wet so that when you cut this hole, this part doesn't blow out. All right, down we go. Pop that back out and just, you know, push it evenly from all sides. Doesn't take much. Save you for later. Then I'm gonna grab my middle size hole cutter. No, I'm gonna go thicker. Go larger than you think you need to. And we'll talk a little bit more about hole size in just a moment. And if you can, consider the placement of your hole and your design. I am really, really tempted to put my hole right here. <laughs> but that's gonna make it a little funny to hang and string up. It will not hang very straight, so uh, maybe I'll flip it around. I'll do a hole up here to echo the little spots that travel down. Down, push, twist, lift. What's really important about small hole colors like this is you absolutely must clean them out immediately. They will clog up so fast. That little tiny bit of clay is gonna dry up, so if you have your pendants lined up, you've got your hole cutter in one hand, your needle tool in the other, make a hole, clean it out, make a hole, clean it out. All right. That's pretty much it for that one. So that's just a real easy texture. Capture it in a shape, put a hole in it. Bob's your uncle. Everything gets sanded. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Absolutely everything I make gets sanded. If you try to adjust these edges, while it's wet, you're gonna actually add more problems, in my experience. If you're good at doing little tiny adjustments on wet clay, go for it. But for me, it's much faster, more efficient. Uh, it just feels easier to do it when it's bone dry. You can do it when it's bisque. I don't like sanding bisque. It's like nails on a chalkboard to me, so I prefer bone dry. Mark? That's next, yes. So that's another cool trick we can do. Uh, let's just ball this up, roll it back out. Wow. <laughs> All right, so let's do another one of these cool things. Plastic over the top will give you, so this is very squared, this one here. It's very squared up, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's see what happens. If, a little bit of plastic, put that over the top. You still wanna see where your design is. I'm gonna go at another angle here. And then, what this does is gives you instant rounded edges and it looks all cool and finished and pro-like. All right, so here's, here's where having that newspaper comes in handy. So I can peel that up. Okay, so here we have, whoosh, all right. So we have rounded edges. It, again, make that a style choice, a design choice. Um, you can do it all the time, but does it work with your texture? Does, is it gonna work with your glazing choices? That's something to consider. And let's put a hole in this. Push, twist, lift, clean it out. So I've made two pendants and I still have all this clay left. <laughs> when I started doing this, I got a bag of Miller clay, 25 pounds. I think it took me about three years to go through it. <laughs> the leftovers of clay, I, I missed that part, can you put it back? Um, yeah, if it's, if it's still wet, mm -hmm. I'll lump it back in there. Yeah, and normally when I'm doing this, I'll wrap this up. Mm -hmm. I'm moving a little bit faster today and I have an entire bag by my side. So uh, yeah, your scraps will dry out. Uh, quickly and you'll find out really quickly that if you're cutting doing textures or the holes that you'll get these little spider cracks where on something larger no big deal something smaller you're gonna see it so we need to pay attention to that all right another way to do design is to let the clay dictate your shape Flip 
move over. And by the way, this crackly business will show up, but for today, I'm gonna just put it on the bottom and not worry about it. But normally I would not allow that through. There's a little tiny bit of cracking in the bottom here, oh, okay. oh, yeah. right? Normally I don't, I do not allow that normally, but for now we're gonna let it ride. All right, so now I have a different texture here with all these groovy squares. And so now I'm gonna let the texture tell me what to do and cut out around the design. Mm -hmm. If you want to do squares or even rounded squares, don't worry about cutting the round squares. Start with your straight edges. Then hack off your corners. See how these little 45 degree things going on? And then wait till it's bone dry. And then it's really easy to round that with your sandpaper. All right, let's release this, put some holes in it. These are a little on the thick side. Uh, somehow my regular skewers, I swapped them out. I'm not sure what happened there. I'm gonna do smaller hole. And for this one, I'm gonna do the corners. When you're working a bunch of them, mm -hmm. how do you know which ones are um, I frequently, I'll get a little tiny wear board, so a little bit of drywall, and just put them off to the side, and that way I can carry them somewhere else if I need to. No. Uh, generally, no, although that's a good question. I, if they're on the thin side and if you've pulled them up a couple times, they do have a possibility, but most of the time, the proportion, the thickness to the size prevents that from happening, although, curiously enough, uh, when I use Laura's turquoise, it causes warping every single time. So it's it's a particular that particular glaze warps it's everything. It's Laura's. It's Laura's. <laughs> right. And that's the only one of the ones that I've tried that do that. I am definitely a blue green purple kind of kid. So okay, so now we have that one. The last one I want to show you for design stuff. Let's get a little bigger chunk. <laughs> I thought about keeping track of like how many things I actually made with the bag, but I just no. couldn't keep up. <laughs> I think for two workshops today, well, I will not even have used a one pound of clay. <laughs> it's crazy. Right? So what I like to do a lot of the time, one of my kind of recurring themes, if we look at this example over here, uh, I like circles a lot. <laughs> I do a lot of circle related things. These are all individual little impressions. And so you get a cohesive style, except each one is unique. It's not one stamp that created all of that. And I'll show you in just a moment, it's multiple things that do that. And then I've loop them all together and then made one of the bigger hole down here. So another fun way to texture is collecting small things and just making a little collage of impressions one bit at a time. Let's see, where are my bits? So I have a pen cap. Wait, I need to, this, so this one I'm gonna cut out first because I wanna know what my area is that I'm working in. So I'm gonna go ahead and do my cut and I'm just gonna do straight up edges on this one. A little raggedy. And then you have your, your shape that you already know what it's gonna be. And it's not gonna get spread out too much. I'm not texturing and, and pushing down on the whole thing. So it's still gonna maintain its shape. And I'm just gonna add some little designs. So I have a pen cap. I have, I think this is a cap to uh, the eraser of a mechanical pencil. <laughs> Super special. Five bucks. Yep. Uh, everyone's favorite, the end of a needle tool. 
So it gets this little cosmic thing going on. Um, and then you can even use your hole cutters, just don't go down all the way. So I'm gonna go, no, let's go large. On the, uh, these hole cutters, there's the sharper edge, and then there's the edge that they've folded, which makes it nicer to hang on to. You can use the folded edge to impress, and then it won't be quite as sharp looking as the other one. So we'll just go like that. And so then we have this kind of cosmic looking thing going on. And then we have to put our hole in and the hole is another circle, right? So conscious placement, figure out, and I've got a little blank spot up here. So I'm going to just pop it right in there. Clean it out every time. And that's it. So the clay part goes really quickly and you'll have fun just knocking out all kinds of pieces and then you'll get to the glazing part and go. <sighs> okay, so what happens? Everyone good so far? Any questions? Good, okay. So we talk tools, all kinds of fun stuff. And um, you'll notice when I cut this one out, I used an X-Acto knife. I never use a needle tool for cutting out things on this scale. The needle tool will displace a lot of clay, whereas your X-Acto gives you a nice clean cut. So just to give you an idea, a little comparison, needle tool. <laughs> this is a real good raggedy example, right? And then, mmm, X-Acto, right? So, and I only use this for clay. This is my clay only exacto because using it clay is gonna dull it for paperwork. So make sure you have that handy. And you might find other uh, cutting tools, but exactos are easy to find. So we have our collection of pieces. We banged out four pieces in very little time. Not that it's a rush, but there's something kind of fun about having all of these potential pieces in front of you that you can do. And again, you can have fun with hole placement. You can do larger holes, smaller holes, collections. You can get sculptural if you want to. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. I just, I kind of like the, the graphic element of the, the texture, create something or your own personal texture and then having that hole in there. Another way to make a pendant is with a glue on bale. So a bale is basically anything that connects your hanging thing to your chain or your uh, cord. So a bale, so here's an example, it's glass, it's not clay, and it just glues on the back. So that can be if, so, and the reason why I bring this up is maybe you have a design that you don't want to interrupt with a hole. So you have options. Is there a glue that you recommend to use it? Either five minute epoxy or E6000 personal choice. E6000 is a little stinky and a little messy to work with, but you don't have to do any mixing. Five minute epoxy, you have to do some mixing, but it's a little not like E6000 gets a little stringy when you work with it. So it's personal choice. I tried to look up online if there's, oh, E6000 has a little bit of flexibility to it. Um, and in this kind of application, I'm not sure that really matters a whole lot. So it's whatever you like, whatever you feel like, whatever's on sale. <laughs> uh, I, I use five minute epoxy. That's it's what I'm used to. And it's certainly very strong. And you can get these in different sizes and different styles, by the way. You will have many shop opportunities to buy findings, which we'll talk about in a bit, to get specialized tools, all kinds of fun stuff. So that's an option is the glue on bale. Once you have your piece done in the clay, then we, when it's bone dry, and that's overnight, boom, you're done. If, right, maybe half a day, depends on the weather. But you want that to be nice and dry. And then we can go in and take care of the edges. So I'm gonna move this over here. If you have lots of sanding to do, Get your mask out. I'm gonna keep it on the short side today. I use 100 grit or finer. Mm -hmm. If you use coarser grit than that, you will probably see the grit lines in your piece. Again, that can be a choice. And when you sand, again, you can do this bone dry or bisque. I prefer bone dry. 
work large surface to small surface. I always start with the back. There's always going to be that little stuff around the hole. There might be some unevenness on the back side. And when you're sanding flat surfaces, don't hold it up in the air like this, because then you're just using the pressure from your fingertips and larger pieces, maybe you won't notice it, but it's all, it's all in the details here. So I'm going to put this on something flat, put this down flat and just run it in some circles that way. Doesn't take much to take care of that little blob on the back side. Then work to your sides. If you have flat sides, same idea, hold it flat. If, you, if it got a little wiggly in the process, you might fudge it a little bit by holding it up and doing it that way. It depends on how precise you want to be. Sometimes what can happen is like, oh, I want to straighten, like if I try to straighten this out, I'm going to lose a lot of that edge because there's a lot of wiggles going on. So you have to kind of pick your battles there. So use that flat surface to help you get nice flat edges. <coughs> you can see, I don't know if you can see this on there, probably not, but there's, you'll be able to see, and you can look really close, um, you can see where the sandpaper has bit into it and that's where you're getting it. And that flat surface will tell you if you're true or not. Okay, now you can go in, do your corners if you have corners to round off, right? And try to work in a movement that echoes the shape rather than kind of working on one spot a whole lot. Just what is a nail file? I don't know. I don't. It looked like you were filing nails. nails. Yeah, yeah, you could. So I thought I was wondering if a nail yeah. file would give you a. You could. It would be harder to clean out the nail file, um, but it is possible. I don't really file my nails. <laughs> Those really fine ones are kind of square, rectangular, and you know, sure. on the ends. Yeah, yeah. And they've got like a sponge inside of them. Okay. So they've got a little bit of give. Mm -hmm. I love those for finding the detailed sanding. The give is good if you, uh, depending on the application. If you're doing the edges. So yeah. The give is good. Yeah. If you're doing the back, you no, know, I would do the Right, right. Um, I'm so used to hand sanding in all of my work. I do metalworking as well, and it's. It depends, like sometimes I want that rigidity behind there and sometimes I just want to be able to feel what's going on. So I'm going to just work these edges a little bit. And then the very last thing to do, if you want to, design choice, is just to soften these corners a little bit. Just enough to make it a little bit more skin friendly because things, things are possibly going to be resting on your skin and once they're fired, they can get sharp. So you just make it a little wear, wear friendly. And you could even choose to do it really rounded, right? Again, design choices. You can figure out what you want to do on the top edge. I'll just give it a little go around. Not too big a deal. And then you blow this off away from people. <laughs> and then I'll show you, uh, your sandpaper is going to get clogged really quick. With That's the thing about bone dry clay. Very easy way to clear this. I'll do this over in the corner so no one gets blasted with anything. That's it. All right, really fast way to clean out your, yeah. <laughs> fast way to, and then you keep using it, right? Because when it's clogged, it's gonna be very inefficient at removing material. It will clog fast, clear it out fast, keep using it. That way you're not um, doing twice the work with clogged sandpaper. So just clean that out. I don't like the sensation of the sandpaper on the bisque. To me, it feels like nails on a chalkboard. It just. What if I use the You can. You can. You can definitely sand it when it's bisque. I just don't like to. Wet sand. I know. You can. Um, wet sandpaper and wet. Yeah, you could. The wet sandpaper generally has two functions. One is to keep dust down and the other is to lubricate things. Um, and that's especially good, like if you're doing glass sanding, right? You want to have that lubrication. Um, yeah, I imagine that would work. But I, I actually like doing this. It, it goes a little fat. When it's bone dry, it goes faster too. It's going to respite. You're going to remove material faster because it's softer. So to me, it just is faster. What's that? It's dust either. Yeah. Yeah. Mask. So I usually, I usually wear a mask, so it's, it's your choice. I like to sand it bone dry if you prefer bisque to reduce your dust. 
uh, you can absolutely do that. It works, it works either way, but sand it in either case, right? Whatever you choose, sand it so you get something that looks more finished. Because it's all, when it's this small, details are everything. So you've sanded your piece, now what? Make yourself a little tray <coughs> to send it through the firing process. Um, how, who uses cookies when they fire? Do you have something under your piece when you're glazing, right? Um, so a little, a little sliver of clay underneath your piece. Um, we do that at higher fire to protect kiln shelves from glaze overruns and also to prevent your piece from, uh, in some cases it helps with plucking, in some cases it helps it from sticking to the shelf. So, not for the bisque per se, other than having the tray go with your work. So I use these multiple times. And sometimes I will just collect my pieces on the tray just so that they're all together. Yeah, and loading the kiln is so much yep. faster to do it this way. Yeah, so for example. Put it on a tray and just put the tray in as opposed to 10 little pieces. Right, except. There's an exception for that, <laughs> right? So maybe maybe I have two other pieces in here and I queue that up. So it's, if you're in a community situation, right, right. this makes it easier to find everything. However, when you are getting to the glaze part, when you're queuing it up for glaze firing, if you're in a community situation, do smaller trays. So let's say you've made 20 pieces. Do five trays that hold four pieces because then whoever's loading can tuck them in anywhere and that's your guarantee you're gonna get loaded. Yeah. <laughs> right, so jewelry, kiln loaders love jewelry because it, it makes us feel like we're really used maximizing the space in the kiln. Yeah. But if someone does a whole big tray of jewelry and they're all like waxed or glued or stuck down and there's not much we can do about it and then we say, well, maybe you get in, maybe you don't. But if you have something this big, it's gonna get loaded, guarantee. All right, so Small trays are good. I wouldn't go much larger than that. It's up to you. Small tray is good. And then the tray with the handle makes it a little easier for whoever's loading to handle it rather than something without sides. And depending on your community studio, these trays make their way back to me, whereas flat cookies don't always do that because they just look like studio cookies. And those are just pinched up sides. Yeah, these are just pinched up sides. They don't have to be anything fancy or pretty. <laughs> just plop your name on it. Okay. Glazing. This is the fun part. Uh, who waxes their stuff to help with glazing cleanup? Anyone? Anyone? Oh. Waxing? Yeah. Um, do you know what alumina hydrate is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Alumina hydrate, especially on these small pieces, especially on porcelain, the bottom should be waxed and then either waxed with alumina hydrate, you can make up a little batch of wax that already has the alumina hydrate mixed in. And in terms of proportions, the answer is some alumina hydrate. <laughs> it's not, there's no particular proportion, just enough that it's gonna act as a release agent. Or you can sprinkle it on your tray. It's a dry powder, right? So you can just sprinkle it on your tray. I like to use it mixed in the wax because then you're only using as much as you need. Whereas if you sprinkle it on the tray, you end up using more resources than you need to. Does it hold over from one firing to the next if you sprinkle it on the tray, like, you know, like seasoning a cast iron pan? Yeah, it, um, it does, except cool? in between firings, you have a tray with some dusty stuff on it. Okay. So I, I would imagine you could go through again, but to me, it's that's like dusk waiting to be blown up. <laughs> okay. So I, I tend not to go that route. I like to wax the back of the piece uh, with the alumina hydrate and then most of it a lot or a lot of it uh, sticks to the piece and Then you got to clean them off when they come out All right, you are bone dry you you are my bisque piece Okay, let's get a fresh sheet No matter what no matter what even if you didn't glaze anything on your piece because this porcelain gets, and this is because I fire at cone 10, mm -hmm. it's gonna get really hot and it likes to melt, just settle into that tray a little bit, right? If your tray has any texture at all, which it's going to, it's gonna settle in and then when you get it out, there's this moment of my piece is stuck. Mm -hmm. So the alumina hydrate uh, eliminates the panic factor and then you can pop your piece right off the tray. So no matter what you do glaze wise, even if you do no glaze, 
get some alumina hydrate on there. Yeah, it's it's a porcelain thing. It's a tiny piece thing. It's a high fire thing. It's only a, a porcelain thing, though. Well, primarily because it uh, because it um, can get really fine. But I would recommend it on anything, frankly, because of the size ratio of this small piece of clay going through a large, very hot firing. I would recommend it at all times. I've, I've done a little bit experimenting with black mountain clay and jewelry pieces, and even though that's kind of groggy, still, 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 like, still sticky, yeah. No matter what, yeah, alumina hydrate on the back. And then having the wax on there does double duty. Sophie. Would you style them, I mean, they style, mm -hmm. <coughs> like uh, beads, for instance, or not? That is a good question. Um, so the glazing on both sides thing is possible. It is more readily achieved in lower fire because not a lot of the rods survive the high firing well, the steel rods, yeah. They'll, they'll be okay, but it's, it's a little iffy. Sometimes they bend and then stuff sticks. Uh, sometimes when you have that vertical surface here, your glaze can run down onto the, the rod. You can, your piece can warp because of the weight of the piece hanging on the rod. So I, that's why I like to do things flat because I, I know that they work. So yeah, it's possible. Um, and like I said, it's more readily achieved lower fire. I've played around a little bit with bead making and I love beads. You can get me going on beads for a while. I used to work at a bead. I've worked at two different bead stores. I have a whole collection of beads. I don't like making them. <laughs> I certainly don't, I've, I've made them in glass and that's a little bit more fun, but I've tried some clay beads and they just did not float my boat. Uh, I like a lot of the pretty rich colors and the glass beads and the stones have their kind of, you know, earth bound quality to it. And the clay ones I've done just didn't, wasn't my thing. So if you get into bead making and you enjoy it, yay you, not my thing. <laughs> so yes, possible. All right, so glazing, I have here my tiny bucket of glaze. Oh, I love this That's your dipping glaze, right? This is my dipping glaze. This is my <laughs> tiny bucket. Yeah, it's that's a bucket of dipping glaze. And again, just think of how many things you can glaze with this thing, right? This is this is forever worth. They could probably get that whole 25-pound bag of clay glazed in here. It's 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 all, I mean, like what I... Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I have I my home in Boulder Creek is less than 600 square feet <laughs> and actually yeah yeah small and you've got room for all your clay supplies in it I still have storage issues yeah all right so I'm mixing up my glaze here I did not wax the back of this we're going to pretend it has wax on it you will need a Good question. Just the back. Because when you have your edges, let's look at our sample over here. All of these edges are glazed. But look at how close the glaze comes to the very bottom. It's just about there. This is sapphire blue, super stable glaze. I have maybe a third of a millimeter clearance. Oh, I need better glasses to see that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, rules about glazing, if you want glaze on the side of your piece, which gives it a nice color frame, depending on what you're doing, you've got to dip it. Brushing is not going to cut it. I've tried it, it fails every time. Uh, not happy with brushing on the sides. Because it's super small, you have to have that even thickness, that even coat of glaze so that you have a nice uniform border to it. The other nice thing about glazed edges is your edges right now, when we cut them, they're like this. And the glaze adds just a little softness to those edges. So it gives it a little extra shape. I like to offer three different styles of glazing. I'm not going to show them all, but they'll be pretty easy to understand. The basic dip goes like this. I've got a scrap wire, a paper clip works just fine. Hook it from front to back, and you'll see why in just a moment. What's funny about glazing jewelry pieces is you have to push them into the bucket. <laughs> they kind of float. So you have to push them down in because they're, they're not gonna just drop in. To wit, eh, all right. <laughs> When the pieces are this small, your clay, and I just kind of wiggle it to make sure nothing's going on that's extra dropping off, right? When your clay is this small, it's not gonna absorb a whole lot. It's pretty limited to how much it can absorb. So still follow your glazing instructions, whatever they may be. If it's a two second dip, do a two second dip. 
but know that three to four second dips probably aren't going to get three to four seconds worth of glaze on there. If you really want to dump the color on, you can, but I recommend um, experimenting with your glazes, see what works best on the small scale. And then the reason why we go front to back is so you can do that and dump it on your paper the right way, right? Otherwise, it's this. Unless you have a cool drying rack and you can hook it over on that, which is an option too, right? You can leave it hanging. So the first session, this actually never dried. So hopefully I thinned it out. We'll see if it dries more this time. How hot do you apply your bisque? The bisque, um, I want to say cone six-ish. I don't, I don't do the oh, bisque. Oh, six. Oh, six. Oh, six. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I am not as well versed on firing stuff. Yeah. Oh wait. Is it oh wait? Okay. okay. So then that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's <laughs> that's the fun of working in the studio. They do the firing there, and I'm I'm more involved in glaze firing than I am in, in the bisque firing. But um, yeah. All right. So we're gonna let you hang out for a bit. See if you will dry. Uh, don't wax the holes. You might be tempted to wax the hole because then no glaze gets in there. But usually what happens is the wax will create a bridge. It's a small enough space that the wax will bridge across and then you end up with glaze sitting on top of that wax. So it's much faster to just forget about the hole. And then what we'll do, assuming this actually dries, is use your X-Acto or a needle tool and just scrape it right back out. It's much faster than trying to prevent the glaze. Just let the glaze go in there, scrape it right out. It's a lot faster. All right, let's move it over here. Okay, so glazing options. Option one is the basic dip, and different glazes get you different effects. If you have great glazes that break over texture, that can be real nice, because then you'll have an even color around the outside, and then it will break over your texture parts. Uh, some glazes look good on the small scale, others don't. For example, at uh, Higher Fire, we have a glaze called Plum Chun, which is this lovely plummy purple. On this scale, it looks kind of brown. It's kind of this weird non-color which is weird to me, um, and also a bummer because I really like purple, so I formulated my own purple blend. Um, and other glazes are going to look great. Sapphire is my best friend in terms of joy. It's super stable. You get lots of color pop. You get the blue and the white. looks really good. Uh, the other ones I use are Perfect Black and Waxy Turquoise. They're just good, solid colors. They're not super fancy. Things like, um, if you're familiar with Breaking Blue, uh, or ashi blue, or so the ones that have really cool effects, which look amazing on larger surfaces, tends to be kind of busy on the small scale. So again, design choice. And um, I have some stuff out on the tables over there. I do have some that have those runnier, um, more interesting glazes on there. So you might find that if you have a cool texture and you put a cool modeled glaze over it, you just kind of end up with a busy thing and you don't really see what's going on. So everything's, you know, we have to scale everything down and make these choices as we go along. That's Mermaid. Mermaid, mm -hmm. Mermaid is really good on textures. And um, so the style in your kits, what I did there is a brush on. And I only do brush on with runny glazes because the brush will all merge together. It'll all run and you won't see brush lines. It's also the fastest way. The edges aren't done. I don't have to. I don't have to wax for cleanup purposes. I do have to wax for the alumina to get that on there. But it's really fast, just to brush, 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 and you're done. You don't have to clean up the hole. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and my all-time favorite fast method is the cheater method, which if you have a, let's say you have two pendants to glaze and you have a 10-gallon bucket of glaze, you're thinking I'm going to mix up that whole thing for like half a teaspoon of glaze. So you can use your brush and you'll probably have some goop on the sides of your bucket and just treat it like watercolor paste. You grab a little water on the top of the bucket, grab a little paste on the side, brush it on, it'll all mix in. Bob's your uncle, it's good. So you can just cheat. You don't have to mix up the whole bucket. And that's a really fun, lazy way to glaze. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> so the brush on is the fastest way to glaze. It doesn't have to be about speed, but that can be a really satisfying way to get, that's how I did uh, 50 pendants for today, <laughs> right? That was the was like, blop, 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 half of you are Monterey Blue, blop, 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 half of you are Mermaid, done. The other thing I like to do, which you see over here, is the scrape off method. So those were dipped, and then using 
either a scrubby, this is a jewelry size scrubby, how cute, <laughs> or... <laughs> well, you see how I've sprawled out here. Uh, my, my jewelry bench, though, is, is only this big. Uh, or a metal rib, so either one of these will work. Metal rib, scrubby. In either case, when you scrape off, you're creating uh, dry glazed particles, so I recommend working over a little container of water so that all your particles fall into water and they're immediately non-threatening. So they're not blown around. So that's your safety tip for that. Uh, dry, dry, are you dry yet? It's not gonna dry, we're gonna wing it. Yeah. All right, so the scrape off will get you cool color pop and that's that's really fun on the small scale right doing that kind of scraping on the large scale is a lot of work and really dusty but on the small scale it's really doable you just give it a scrape and that can be a fun way to really make your textures come out all right just checking my notes making sure i'm not missing anything all right you're not quite dry we're going to make it work So in terms of cleanup on these, right, assuming that you wax the back and it's all nice and clean, we're just going to make that work here. All right. So I don't wax up the sides. I just let my sponge give me a little clearance. And that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Millimeter at the most, half a millimeter stable glazes. Just let your sponge do that for you. Just kind of clean off the corner. And that's all you need. And you will need to experiment. Some of the runnier glazes, like the ones, like I mentioned Flambe and Vegas Red, which are almost the same thing, you need a heavier coat to see the color. I don't really use those because they're gonna, they end up running off the sides and I don't see my texture. So it'd be nice to have those. I do sometimes a little bit of Flambe, but it's, again, it's get to know your glazes on the small scale. All right, and then assuming I've gone all the way around and the edges Yes, it's still wet. And then just take your X-Acto and <laughs> it's really amusing to do it when it's wet. But that's all it takes is just clean it out. The number one fail on glazing pendants is if you don't clean out your hole, your edges are clean, it comes out, it's on your tray. Get the tray here. What will happen is if there's any glaze in that hole, it will very often just tack your piece onto the tray. So you're looking at it like that should come off. It's not coming off. I did my wax. I did my cleaning. The hole will trip you up more often than not. So make sure that you have your X-Acto knife with you when you're glazing or a needle tool. The X-Acto works really well and just carve out all that little bit of and there was no glaze left in there at all. It can be a little bit. But it needs, you know, like if, if there's like a haze of glaze, or even if there's glaze up near the top, that's okay. But you need to make sure that it's, there's not enough glaze in there that it's going to run down and stick to your tray. And in, in general, and also uh, keep in mind in terms of hole size, right, we're going to have shrinkage. And then if you add a layer of glaze, now your hole's even smaller. So that's a thing to factor. Speaking of hole size, let's check in with that. In your pendant, you have... Are we all there? We're all there. Okay. We have basic pendant hole size. You have your scale there, right? So you're, you're just working with scale there. That's a design thing. But in terms of functionality, we want to look at hole size this way. Let's blow this image up here a little bit. So here's a blow up side view. And here's our hole. Right? If the hole is really small, it's going to be tough to get a jump ring through there. And the jump ring through there is your circle, your ring of metal, which is open on one part. Right, So it's open there. That's what makes it a jump ring. It jumps two things together, two or more things together. So let's say I have this size hole. This is the cross section. We can see that this channel is the hole. And let's say my jump ring is this big. Right, this diameter here is not going to make it through here. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So you will need to factor in the thickness of your clay. 
the size of your hole here. And then your jump ring will have inner diameter, outer diameter, and really what that amounts to is the diameter and the gauge. The gauge is the thickness of the wire. So your jump rings can have different diameters. They can have different gauges. You could have a 10 millimeter jump ring in 20 gauge that would look kind of like that. You could have a 10 millimeter jump ring. Okay, that's not in scale. Hello. 10-ish milli, and you could have it in, we'll call this, uh, if that's 20, this is gonna be like 16, right? The higher the number, the skinnier the wire. I don't know who came up with that, but that's the way it is. So 20 gauge, 20 gauge is the size that's in your kits. Um, and that would be kind of the minimum for a jump ring in most cases. It, thicker will give it a little bit more rigidity. So as you're creating your pieces, pay attention to hole size. Remember that they're gonna shrink. Remember that if there's glaze in there, it will shrink it even more. When in doubt, go large, right? Give yourself that option. Plus, if you are thinking of using cord, it will also you know, factor in how thick is your cord. The cord that's included in your kits is a pretty skinny cord um, because it was a very economical way to make kits for everybody to have this hemp cord, but maybe you're using a leather cord and sometimes those are thicker. So you wanna bear all those things in mind. So we got our piece glazed. We send it through on a little tray or more. We've cleared our holes. Where are we, what's happening? Findings, what are findings? Findings are the practical bits of jewelry. And let's get a clean white paper out here, why not? All right, so findings are things like jump rings. So here's a jump ring, this little ring here. And you can get jump rings in different sizes. If you get really into it, you can make your own. This is a jump ring that I made. So when it gets larger like this, it becomes a little bit more of a design component. You can use jump rings to connect lots of things together. Jump ring, uh, findings also include your clasps. This is a lobster clasp here. I think I use mostly lobster clasps. You can also get uh, jump ring, sorry, spring ring clasps, which are pretty common. And they look, this is my quickie drawing. So this is the part that would attach to the chain. Here's the little lever. Here's the part that goes into the other side to hook up mm -hmm. to your thing, right? You've all seen these before, despite my drawing. <laughs> and again, design choice. For example, if I'm doing something like that piece over there, which is nothing but circles, I'm gonna put a spring ring on there because it's also a circle. <laughs> That's just the level that I like to get to in terms of details. Other findings can include ear wires, they can include head pins, which are used for doing beading type stuff. Um, so it's all the functional parts of joy. If we look at different kinds of chain, the most common is a cable chain, which is what this one is here. It's your real basic cabling things together. This is a very small cable chain. This is a wheat chain. This is where we get into fun names. This is a wheat chain. A wheat chain is a less expensive version of a snake chain. <laughs> you can get box chain, you can get Figaro chain, you can get chains that I don't even know the names of. That's a big old rabbit hole that you will have fun diving into if you go chain shopping. On your handout, you have some resources suggested to you. The two biggie online ones are Rio Grande and Fire Mountain Gems. They both carry tons of stuff. I'm a Rio Grande fan just because it's easy and they have almost everything I need and uh, I've shop, been shopping there for probably over 20 years. Back in the days when you had to get on the phone to get something. <laughs> yeah. And I use sterling silver. You can get uh, different metals. You can get different alloys, right? If you're just starting out and you want chain, you can get things like silver plate, which are going to be cheaper. They will, you'll, the plating can wear out over time. So it just depends on what kind of investment you want to make. And because I sell 95% of what I make, I'm going with the quality stuff. Plus, if you're putting in the time on your pendant, you're putting in some time on this uh, porcelain piece, you're putting time in on the glazing for sure. 
uh, let that be reflected in the quality of your other materials. Don't sell yourself short by making, you know, making it cheaper than you think it would be. You can also get into different kinds of cord. So the one that's in your kit is hemp. There's lots of different fibers you can use. There's waxed cotton, which is really nice. A lot of people like leather. I don't use leather for personal choices, but it's certainly an option for you. Um, and you can get into cool knot tying as well. We're going to do a little bit of knot tying in a bit, pretty soon, actually. Yes. Uh, so I'm looking at these, and I'm I'm not much of a jewelry person, but I'm thinking ornaments. Yeah. Kind of thing. Sure. What gauge of wire would you recommend for hanging off of it? Something strong enough. Like so, you said twenty. The the. Twenty is definitely too skinny. Right. So twenty is too skinny, but you want to go with sixteen. Sixteen. 14. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a, here's an interesting thought on that line. It's also going to depend on what you use. You could use heavy copper, but copper is really soft, mm -hmm. so it's going to bend really easily. So you might get say galvanized steel. And you could go skinnier on the steel because it's not going to be as bendy. So that's that's part of the thing to factor in. Uh, middle of the road is going to be brass. So between copper and steel, in terms of bendability, brass is good. Plus, it will look nice on the tree. And actually, copper would look really nice on the tree too. Just be aware that you want to give yourself enough. Yeah, they're like earrings for the tree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So you're making giant ear wires. Um, on that note. I do teach uh, wire working classes, so if anyone is interested in adding to their skill set with wire working skills, I have a piece of paper on the last table there. You can put your email down and uh, if enough people are interested, we can arrange a class. I can do one at my location, I can come to your location. Uh, we can work that out later. All right, let's talk jump rings. When you open and close a jump ring, the important part is that you never pull it open this way because then you've wrecked the round shape and you'll never get it back. Almost never. The key is to twist it open. And then when you twist it shut, we want to make sure that we're pushing in just enough that they overlap a tiny bit and then just slide next to each other so you have a little bit of spring tension holding it shut. And then looking at it from above and all sides to make sure that it looks like you've lost your seam, that it's um, disappeared. So let me demo what that looks like. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. In terms of these tools here, um, we're not going to use these. They just all travel together for me. This is, uh, these are needle nose pliers. This is a chain note. This is where we get into cool terms where you can sound all official and professional and stuff. These are chain nose. They have a taper. These are flat nose. You have larger versions. They're exactly the same otherwise. So this flat side is um, flat nose. And what's important about these is these are not tools you grab from the garage because no teeth on the inside, right? If you have teeth on your pliers, you're going to be putting teeth marks in your stuff, right? So it's important to have tools dedicated for your jewelry making because don't you want jewelry tools? I know I do. And they will, I've been using these for probably 30 years. They, they will last. If you're only using them for jewelry, they're going to last you a long time. Okay, jump ring. Sometimes you can do it with a tool in one hand. If you've been doing this for as long as I have, you have some pretty tough little fingers. Otherwise, you're going to use two. And grabbing and then twist it open. And we need it because this is, has some thickness here, right? So we need to be able to get in there. So I maybe didn't need to go quite that much, but you do need to be able to pass the thickness of your pendant. And then when you close, notice that with the flat ones, the flat nose, I can grip this way. With the skinnier ones, although yours are wide enough, sometimes I'll grab it this way. So this way gets both my elbows out and I feel like I don't have as much control. Whereas this way I can tuck one elbow in and be more stable. We all know about tucking our elbows in if you're on the wheel. And then close that up, slight overlap. That's a little too much, but you get the idea. You can do a little sandwich action to get it closer. I'm going to switch to my fingers here. And then the goal is to have it line up. Sometimes what can happen is you get a little gap or it's a little bit off. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? I don't, this is probably not going to, no, you're not going to be able to see that in there. Um, but I, I like to take the time to make sure it's perfectly lined up, right? When it's off a little bit, that's this, that one little thing, like everything else you spent all that time on, you did your careful sanding, your careful glazing, you cleaned the hole out, you've got a nice chain, and then your jump ring's like, yeah. right? It's that, that's like, I was too tired to spend 10 more seconds <laughs> lining up my jump ring. I get that. But if you can, get it lined up. All right. So the jump ring, the, the hole in the pendant and the jump ring is the simplest way to do it. There are other kinds of bales you can get. And we did talk a little bit about the glue on. So the glue on, for example, would look kind of like that, which can be really lovely, your uninterrupted surface. Um, I'm, just, I'm just not into gluing things for whatever reason. It just feels, um, I like things that are a little bit more mechanical and not relying on adhesives. Not really. I just, I guess I just don't like, in this, in terms of materials, I like the metal, I like the porcelain glue, feels like a weird added material to me. Um, you know, if, I don't know, paper crafting, it seems normal. It's just, I'm just not big on it, but that doesn't mean, you know, you can't do it. Like, there are gonna be times when this is the best look, this is the best design choice. And if that's the case, then yeah, glue it. Okay, jump rings were good. So far, is it good? Excellent. Now, for fun, we can do a little knot tying. I have my jumbo here because it's going to be easier to see than the little one. And on your handout, page two, you have a really simple adjustable sliding knot. And this is a lovely way to finish cord so that you're not trying to put a clasp on there. It does need to be long enough to slip over your head when it's at its longest. Um, so you can just watch one time and see how this goes. The general concept is that you're making something that does this, right? You've got a knot grabbing here and a knot grabbing here and then they can slide and the knots will catch themselves and then you can open it back up. So what that looks like is uh, an overhand knot is the simplest knot there is. It's the first knot you do if you're doing a square knot. It's when you're tying your shoes, that's an overhand knot, okay? And then what we'll do, the idea here is so just in terms of envisioning the concept, this is not how you actually do it. The concept is that we have these two overhand knots and that they pass through that way. So to make that happen, overhand knot through, and your, your pendant's down, down here, by the way. And then if you want to, you can tighten this up and just slide it out of the way. Make sure you have enough to work with. And then this one's gonna get an overhand knot. It just has to be around this cord here. The trick is to make sure that you tie it back on itself. So here's my sliding part. This is gonna wrap around here. Tighten, tighten, and then you can work these knots closer to the end or just trim the ends, and then you have an adjustable knot. Okay, try it. You have pictures, you have your cord, <laughs> yes. Yeah, go ahead and put your, well, you can put your pendant on or you can open up your jumper later and pop it on that way. So overhand knot on one side. Pass your other end through and as you do that, you're going to be going, right, so I have my short end there. Go away from your short end. Tighten one side up, move it along and go around and then be sure to tie it back on itself, not on the part that needs to be moving. And uh, this is another rabbit hole you can go down, which is knot tying. So many cool knots you can tie. Uh, you can get books on Chinese knotting, which are beautiful and really fun and also complicated and fiddly. <laughs> you can get into, uh, there's lots of cool examples. This is paracord and there's lots of cool paracord things you can do. Uh, a YouTube guy that I found recently is called Why Not, which is, it's gonna be right side up. Why Not on YouTube. Right, um, so if you look him up on YouTube, he does very clear instructions on knots. And they're all paracord stuff, but you can translate a bunch of it to uh, jewelry and cords and stuff like that. Decorative knots, 
So I'll, I'll do the loose version and it's, it's, if you can kind of visualize where you're headed, right? This is the loose version. So you have an overhand knot, overhand knot, and then they pass through each other. So it's just keeping, keeping track of what's going where. And once you've done it, once, or once you get it, it's like, oh, okay, now it makes sense. And then you can always um, cinch these up. With cord, especially with uh, fiber cord, your ends can get kind of fuzzy and ratty. Paracord, you can melt it, but otherwise a little dab of nail polish will hook you up, keep your cord from going anywhere. Um, some of us have nail polish at home. I had to buy some. <laughs> the, the first session of nail polish, we're potters. How can we paint our nails? Let's say, all right, bonus round. Oh, bonus round. You can also do a decorative knot closer to your piece. Um, I would ideally have this a little closer. And this is handy if you have a piece where maybe you don't want a jump ring. Maybe you just want go direct with cord. If you do cord in pendant, notice that it hangs sideways, right? And even though it'll be up against here, the odds of it kind of flopping around are pretty high. It's not the most uh, aesthetically pleasing way to hang a thing. So if you do this kind of knot here, that can help with that because now we've brought them together and then they can go whatever direction they need to. So let us do a fancy knot. This is called a double connection knot. It will look a little complicated. Again, once you've tied it once or twice, it will make sense. You can also find this on YouTube. It's called a double connection knot. And for this one, your piece will already be on. Is it easier if I go this way or up here, see it live? I guess we'll, we can do both. We can do both. So we're going to go sideways here. And I'm holding this in my left hand. I'm going to take the bottom piece, make a loop, and go behind. So I went over and then behind and down. And I'm just going to hang on to this intersection here. This is still the same working end that I was just using. Go through. Now I have these two lobes. I'm going to tighten this top lobe here by pulling down here. So I'm still hanging onto this intersection here. Switch to the other side. Around, I'm going over this one, behind the whole mess. Through, so down and through, down and through, first lobe, down and through, second lobe. Switch to your other piece, tighten it up. Go back to the first one, tighten it up. And what you're looking for is this little cross here. Just a nice little, a little knot that shows you took a little time, right? You could just do an overhand knot, but this has a nice symmetry to it that would look really good. So if you wanna try that, you can. Like I said, there's tons of decorative knots on YouTube. And the, what's nice about the hemp cord you have here is it's grippy. Once you tie your knot, it's, it's good. Uh, I use rat tail or silk satin cord, sorry, satin cord a lot because I like the look of it. It does not hold knots. <laughs> they just, boop, they come right out. Uh, so it looks real nice and it drapes really nice, but it does not hold knots very well. I'll do that one more time just in case you want it. So sideways, bottom piece, over and behind. Same piece, goes through. Then leave this, you're gonna be tempted to pull it all the way through. Leave this part open here, tighten this one by pulling. Okay, so this is up here. Now I switch to my other working end. Go around the back. Down and through, down and through. Switch, pull. I don't expect you to memorize this, but you can find it on YouTube under double connection knot. You can also find a diamond knot, which is a good one. It's a little fancier than this, which means it's a little harder than this. <laughs> but 
Yeah, this is definitely, you can see this, it's a little easier in terms of dexterity in your hands. Um, it's handy to have paracord. And it's just, I don't know, there's something really pleasing about tying knots and paracord, and then you can translate it to whatever you're working on. I almost never use cord this skinny. Like I said, it was just a, a good way to get everybody their kits. Mm -hmm. So you can, if take your pendants home, you can swap them over to chain, you can upgrade, you can do whatever you want with them. Anybody have any questions? About this part. Hmm? Um, do we have it in this part? Yeah, the jump ring? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is it necessary or can we skip it or not? Design choice. <laughs> yeah. So this is going to look one way. Hanging, right, we've got our pendant going to the jump ring, to going to the cord. So you've got three different materials going on. You've got a black cord, you've got a silver ring, you've got your blue pendant on white porcelain. There's a bunch going on there. You might like something more simple. Let's just pop this one off here. Oh, and I didn't even do this one. So this is, this is another really easy way to do cord. You probably all know this one, which is to get your loop through. Again, your whole size is going to determine if you can get cord through there in this fashion or not, right? This is a very basic way to do a cord, too. You've, seen, you've all seen this before. So yeah, you can do that, right? That's a different look than this, right? I would, I would say this is a little fussy. Right, we're just doing this for sample purposes. This feels like it has a little bit more flow. You've got your lines and the pendant coming up and out into your cord here. And also, in terms of design choices, you can do this either way, right? If so, talking about knitting again, this would be the knit side. Mm -hmm. This would be the purl side, mm -hmm. right? Because you have this little loop up top here. And you can choose to have it look this way. You can choose to have it look that way. The point is to be conscious of your choices. Any questions? I don't. I've played with them a little bit, um, and part of my design, the sprig molds are all kind of existing stuff that we have at the studio, and I haven't honestly shopped for any, um, so I haven't found any that really kind of go with my design vibe, and um, I have taught using sprig molds, and those can be interesting to put on a background that you would then put a hole in, or do, or you could do a sprig mold and then do a glue on. Um, but I don't use them in my work so much because I haven't found any that really speak to me. But yeah, it's absolutely an option. Then you have your instant little sculpture, your little bas relief, which would be fun for sure. Alrighty, um, I do have stuff over there if you want to check out different um, styles of things that I've done. There's some earrings over there. You can see what it looks like on an even smaller scale. I have some pieces that I've stitched parts together with very tiny holes. That is super fiddly. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.